Welcome to the Cantina Chatter Podcast. Turn up your nostalgia. everyone and welcome back. I'm Victoria, your host here on the Cantina Chatter podcast, your resource for new and retro toys, pop culture, and randomness from the 80s and 90s. In this episode, we are talking the Star Wars modern toy line retrospective, and we're continuing it with the Clone Wars line that kicked off in 2003 as a really part of the saga line that was out from 2002 to 2004. Uh, It was basically just a little subset of that line, but it was properly marked Clone Wars, and uh, it was a fairly expansive little line. Not a huge toy line, but it did offer uh, some pretty interesting stuff, some really cool stuff, and uh, we're going back to talk about all things Clone Wars. Now, this isn't to be confused with The Clone Wars, the uh, CGI animated show that kicked off in 2008 back on Cartoon Network. That was uh, a different series. This was also on Cartoon Network, but it was just known as Clone Wars and uh, has since been known as the Micro Series. And it's not canon anymore. It's not officially part of the Star Wars saga or the Star Wars universe, but uh, it's still a very critical piece, especially if you were around back then and you were watching this TV show and uh, you were collecting the toys. So we definitely want to cover it as part of this retrospective. So so I'm super glad to be welcoming back the one and only Adam Paulus, who uh, was on the previous retrospective episode focusing on that saga line. And I just thought it made sense to have him back to cover Clone Wars as well, since, uh, as I noted, it was really kind of ingrained into the saga line. In other news, San Diego Comic-Con is about to get underway next week, so really looking forward to that. Stay tuned to the channel, stay tuned to Victoria's Canteen on social media to see what the latest news and updates are going to be regarding San Diego Comic-Con and all the toy lines that we love and collect and talk about and, you know, share passion for. So. I am planning to do some video content for it. I will be at Comic-Con and I'm hoping to learn a little bit about the toy lines that we love, like Hasbro Star Wars, Mattel Jurassic, and so on and so forth. So really looking forward to that. And I'm really looking forward to meeting some of you. I know that some of you are going to be over at Comic-Con and I've met quite a few people from uh, the online toy community, from the YouTube community, uh, as well as uh, those of you that I've come to know through fandoms on social media. So. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you again and to meeting new people as well for the first time that I haven't met in person. So uh, if you do see me at San Diego Comic-Con wearing my Victoria's Cantina t-shirt, don't hesitate to say hello. I'm really looking forward to meeting you. We've also got some new episodes of Collect Jurassic World, if you're listening to that podcast as well, talking about all things in the Jurassic franchise, including toys, obviously. So, um, you know, definitely check us out if you haven't already. It's been a blast putting that show together with Tim from Collect Jurassic and uh, having a whole lot of fun doing that. The Discoveryland podcast, uh, we're on the second half of season two. So that is going to be wrapping up uh, early August. So if you're a theme parks fan or a Disneyland fan, um, hope you're tuning into that as well. It's a very research intensive show <laughs> uh, for all I know about Disneyland history, being a huge Disney nerd. There's still a lot I don't know. So it, it does take a lot of work to put those together and I learn a lot doing it. So I, I love it. It's an absolute blast. It just takes a little bit of time to uh, to put all these shows together, as you might imagine. And then, yeah, we have a lot coming up in YouTube as well. I've been focusing on some of the latest Star Wars, the Black Series action figures. Recently looked at the Star Wars Rebels six-inch figures. Chopper and Ezra Bridger, both fantastic figures, especially that Chopper. Like, seriously, that's like a top five Black Series figure for me. Um, so check out that review. See how amazing Chopper is. I recently took a look at the Mattel Jurassic World Legacy Collection John Hammond action figure. That's the San Diego Comic-Con exclusive. Uh, Mattel was kind enough to send us a review sample to check him out. And uh, he's an awesome figure. I'm also doing a giveaway for that figure, so if you want it, 
Go ahead and check the video out and see what the rules are for entering into the giveaway contest. And uh, who knows, maybe you might win. Also got a couple new reviews coming this week. I haven't yet looked at the Mattel Jurassic World Quetzalcoatlus, so that is on tap for next week, uh, sometime next week, week and a half. And I've also got a couple McFarlane uh, figures that I'm eager to get reviewed. They're pretty new figures and I just haven't gotten around to looking at them. Stay tuned for that over on the YouTube channel. And uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and welcome our friend Adam Paulus back to the show. All right, so Adam Paulus, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Victoria. Great to be here. Yeah, great to have you back. Uh, we just spoke about the Star Wars Saga line, and uh, that was a really great chat. There was uh, that, that's a huge line that's very, very expansive. So many things that were part of it, and um, we're, we're, we're focusing a little bit more on Clone Wars, which is uh, something that was part of the Saga line, I guess you could say. It was, it was kind of its own little segment within it. Um, we didn't talk about it during that episode because, uh, you, know, you know, it is kind of a separate thing. Uh, but then there's also an animated line for it, which is also pretty focused. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to talking about Clone Wars, but not the Clone Wars. Ah, yes, the distinct difference between the uh, <laughs> Samurai Jack creator thing versus the CG Magnum Opus. You know, the thing where they said, uh, I, one of the stories I loved, and I assume it's true, was they said, well, we want to do a cartoon, George, to George Lucas. And he's like, okay, you can do it for yeah, a minute. And they're like, oh, about <laughs> 10 minutes. And they compromised on three. So you get these three-minute episodes and then novels and comic books and a couple of video games that were supposed to drive a whole merchandising campaign for mm. a year and change. And they did a nice job. They did. And three minutes is, in fact, a bit longer than Galaxy of Adventures. Yeah, yeah. Those you can blink and you miss them. Yeah, a little, a little too short. <laughs> um but yeah, so another good thing today is uh, no allergies. You're very lucky. I've been having uh, lots of fun sneezing over here. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, as I was editing that last episode, I was like, oh, wow, that must have been a really bad allergy day because I, I could really hear it. Um, but yeah, today's a, a lot better. And um, yeah, so let's go ahead and jump right into it. So thinking back to 2003, uh, Clone Wars micro series uh, by uh, Gendy Tartakovsky. Um, was pretty, uh, I mean, just stylistically, it's very different from what happened later in the, uh, the Clone Wars. Uh, and, uh, it was a very different sort of show. I think they were going for a lot more of a stylized and perhaps, uh, exaggerated, uh, sort of, um, of, a uh, aspect than what we got with the Clone Wars, the more CG oriented show, uh, from 2008. Um, so looking at, um, it from, uh, 2019, uh, kind of perspective. Um, how do you think it stacks up when, when you compare one to the other? It's fun to go back and watch it because it really did a nice job simplifying everything over, uh, you know, short series of seasons. You got most of the action you wanted in a fraction of the time. And uh, what I always got a big kick out of for the three minute episodes is it's like somebody somewhere heard the big criticism, which I think is not completely unfair. George Lucas was not the best at writing dialogue in the prequels. So for that Clone Wars micro series, they basically got rid of all the dialogue. So it was just all action, a couple of jokes, uh, something <laughs> blows up and you're having a good time. There's no time to catch your breath and think about anything. I mean, the, uh, not to spoil too much for a show this old and you guys already know what happened, but like there's a sequence in season three where Luke and Leia are uh, brought into the world that was just conveyed by a light going off in an apartment. I mean, they've done some interesting creative things and the shorthand on the show is incredible because they had to do it that way yeah and you you bring up an interesting thing because there isn't a lot of dialogue in the show uh, especially in the very first season they did back in 2003 it is very action heavy uh it's all about the visuals and the explosions and all that and um i, I think as it got more into the second season which i believe was in 2005 uh then they did kind of focus it the episodes got a bit longer uh, I think they were maybe around, were they around like 20 minutes or so? Yeah, I think it might have been, I think maybe it was a last one was a little bit longer, but they were mostly like 15-ish minutes. So it was okay. long enough so you could get something good out of it. And, you know, I think at about that time, that was what uh, Adult Swim was doing for their comedy show. So it was pre-YouTube, no, pre-YouTube, uh, post-normal attention span. Mm, yeah, yeah, it make, <laughs> makes sense. Um, yes, yeah, so it was very different. And uh, I think... You know, thinking back to the voice actors they utilized, I think they, they had 
quite a bit of the cast that that ended up later on the Clone Wars um, uh, for Obi Wan, Yoda, um, and um, I don't remember if Dooku was voiced by the same person that uh, that provided the voice on the Clone Wars, but. Um, yeah, it seems like a lot of the talent that they used for, for the, the voice actors actually made their way over to Clone Wars later on, the Clone Wars. Yeah, I mean, they had a lot of good, stable, regular actors that would be in the video games and everything. And I know Count Dooku was Corey Burton, I think, on the CG, the Clone Wars, but for the mm. life of me, I can't remember who it was on the, uh, 2003 show. Mm. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was an interesting show and it, and it gave us a little bit of something to do, uh, outside of toys, because obviously we were buying toys in between films, but... Uh, for people that maybe weren't, uh, you know, you had this sort of entertainment that you could look to uh, between Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith. And I remember one of the things that they were saying uh, when they brought this show out was that um, basically between uh, Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, there's three years. And, uh, you know, both in universe and in the real world, you know, while we're waiting for these films. So they were they were I remember somebody saying and I forgot where it was mentioned. I think it was somewhere in the marketing for the show that. Uh, the Clone Wars show, the TV show, was going on uh, during the same time uh, in the real world as we're waiting for Clone Wars uh, or for Revenge of the Sith to come out. Does that make any sense? <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, with the comics, too, it was great because, especially in the 90s, Dark Horse would bounce around the timeline. Like, now it's before Return of the Jedi. Now it's after Return of the Jedi. Now it's before this. Now it's after that. And with the Clone Wars, for a couple of glorious years... We got to go forward, which is something Star Wars is really shy about doing. Uh, and like right now, Galaxy of Adventures are not even letting us go forward. And I think that's one thing that kind of hurts the sequel series mm-hmm. is when The Force Awakens ends, you're stuck in that, that moment for years. And then when The Last Jedi ends, you're stuck in that moment for years. Uh-huh. Uh, with The Clone Wars, you actually got to keep going ahead and thinking about, well, then what happened? And what happened then? And, you know, you weren't frozen uh, and that made it so much more fun because it encouraged you to play and use your imagination and speculate as opposed to like, well, why are we going to say anything? Because nothing's going to happen until December. So we'll just mm-hmm. wait, I guess. Absolutely. Uh, the show, I think, was also a great introduction to other characters that did become more prominent in the canon later on. Uh, like for Revenge of the Sith, uh, you know, Grievous was yeah. introduced during Clone Wars. Uh, Asajj Ventress, uh, she became a very prominent character in the Clone Wars animate, uh, animated series later on. Um, but this was our first introduction to her uh, and to Grievous. So it was pretty cool to see those characters early on and see these earlier iterations of uh, how they were uh, portrayed. Yeah, and it was neat to see what they kept and what they didn't because Asajj Ventress got to stick around and I thought that was great. But uh, this is the first and last time you really get to see Dirge. I guess he's <laughs> in the comic books and that's it. And uh, for somebody who had like that, uh, depending on which era of canon you're from, Mythosaur skull or Bantha skull or whatever on his chest like Bubba Fett had on his shoulder, it seemed like there was so much more there to have, and there was less. Exactly. Yeah, Dirge was a very interesting uh, sort of character. Uh, I, I feel like he kind of served the purpose that, that Grievous does in uh, the Clone Wars later on, and uh, in Revenge of the Sith, maybe to some extent. Um, but uh, one thing I do want to mention about, I'm sure you recall the really great episode of Clone Wars where Obi-Wan is... Uh, he's on the speeder bike and he's he's going against the IG Lancer droids. Which ah, are, I love that. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I actually I had a mythology class that I was taking back in uh, my very first year of college, and um, we had to focus on like a certain character in popular media. So I used Obi Wan Kenobi, <laughs> uh, and and I shared this uh, this short to kind of illustrate you know some of his uh, heroic aspects, and uh, I got to show that. And uh, at this point, you know, nobody had. It, it, this was like when the show was on uh, and uh, nobody was really watching it in this particular class, but um, some of them got hooked on it because of how cool it was. I don't think you can watch one of these things at three minutes and say like, OK, I, I've had enough. I mean, every episode left you wanting more. And uh, one of the things that was kind of funny about that is it didn't really give you that much because you got a few episodes with Obi-Wan on uh, Munalist, which were great. You got this banking planet. The designs of the buildings are based on like the memorials in the back of our money. And they really went out of their way to convey cool stuff in almost no time you get to see obi-wan you know drive around and like joust with robots which like you don't get that in the movies yeah you got the uh chariot race in episode one but uh this kind of crazy action sequence is something a centerpiece that i think we could use more of and seeing obi-wan actually get to be a hero is something i think everybody who grew up on the original trilogy was waiting to see and even more than the movies you got to see real heroic craziness here and I would love to see Obi-Wan show up and just whack across an army of robots again. 
Absolutely. And uh, one of the greatest, I think, uh, things about Clone Wars Season 1 uh, was that really big cliffhanger that we get at the very end of the season. Do you remember it? Was that the one? Oh, I might be confusing with Season 2's cliffhanger. Uh, the uh, gunship? Yes. 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 Uh, I think that was, th- that was the one with our first introduction to Grievous, correct? Uh, in, in anything, really. I think it might have been. Or, yeah, because like, they had the... The first batch of episodes, and then they waited like a month to do the second batch. Of, that was okay, yeah. So that one, um, but yeah, you got to see that gunship, which like it, it unfortunately did not come out in the first Clone Wars line, but they didn't forget it, and they introduced the whole thing of let's put crazy artwork on these things, like the World War II bombers, mm-hmm. and uh, seeing something like that flying around, and seeing General Grievous go against an army of Jedi, one of which is based on a popular uh, comic book character, and another one is based on Shaggy from Scooby Doo. It's a uh, <laughs> It's a valentine for animation dorks, Star Wars fans. You couldn't walk away from this and not go like, oh, yeah, they did that for me. You know, just every few minutes there was something in here that you're just happy to see. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that that was a fantastic episode as well. And uh, the, I, th- I think that was the cliffhanger, the way they handled it. Uh, Grievous, we see him. And then I think we had to wait till the next season where, you know, the, the, we see the continuation of that episode to see exactly who he killed and uh you know what the damage was and how you know the the remaining jedi get rescued and um it's an interesting thing because I, I just thinking about cliffhangers in general in, in star wars animation i can't really think of any other instance even i mean i know in, in clone wars later on there's obviously a lot of story threads that you know weren't explored and it looks like they're going to be getting to that later this year but um I don't think there was really anything at the end of any of those seasons that was quite on the level of, uh, oh my gosh, who's who's this new you know character? You know how is he so powerful? And you know what, what's going to happen the next season? So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look back, because I remember being young enough to watch the Ewoks and Droids Adventure Hour, the Ewoks never gave you a cliffhanger, <laughs> and the Droids series I loved to death, but they never really made it feel like you had to tune in next week. They did a really good job wrapping it up and continuing it from week to week. So to give you a level of tension where you're just sitting there being like, what did I just see for months and years? Actually, I think it was like a year between uh, Mm -hmm. seasons. That was a stroke of brilliance on their part. And I hope when it's conducive to do so, we get to see something like that again. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and look at the toys here. So as I mentioned, uh, there's kind of two... Uh, sublines within Saga that focus on Clone Wars. And the first one is more of a realistic style line um, that focuses on characters that we know, like Anakin, uh, Mace Windu, Obi-Wan. And, uh, you know, these are these are new designs that aren't actually seen in Clone Wars. I don't know if they were uh, created by Hasbro or, you know, who it was that, you know, came up with these looks. Uh, but then there's also the animated line, which these these other figures, they're, they're sort of like little statues. They have a few points of articulation, but they look like they stepped right off of the animation. I thought they were fantastic for the era because you were basically getting a statue for the price of an action figure, which I remember a lot of people were not happy about because you didn't get leg articulation on these guys. Mm. But they, I'm sure many of the older fans out there remember the Warner Brothers Studio Store where you would see these really cool maquettes for like 150 bucks and animations. And this is the first time you saw something kind of like that for Star Wars, because even the old cartoon Star Wars figures didn't look this stylized. So it was really cool to be able to go to the store, buy an Asajj Ventress. I just saw an Asajj Ventress at a Goodwill missing her head the other day, by the way, uh, for like a couple of bucks. And it looks just like what you saw on TV. You can put it on your desk and it's basically a statue for an action figure price. Yes, super cool stuff. Um, so let's look at the very first wave of the uh, the regular, um, more live action sort of looking uh, Clone Wars figures. So I think there were three waves, I want to say. Um, it was pretty well contained. Is, does that sound correct to you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember back in, uh, I want to say it was my birthday weekend in 2003. I was cruising around Phoenix. to. I used to do these birthday toy runs where I would go to pretty much every Target, Walmart, and indie toy store in town. It took three days. Oh, nice. Because I was looking for wave one, which shipped both as individually carded figures, like they usually come, and also as a double pack where you got Anakin, Yoda, or um, uh, Arc Trooper with a second bonus figure basically on a twice as wide card back. And there was like a white clone trooper, a yellow clone trooper, and a blue clone trooper. So I was going for every Walmart in town because the two packs were $4.96 when they came out. Not on clearance, that was the retail price, and that was just mind-boggling so i was going all over phoenix scottsdale glendale 
Tempe, and it takes a long time to get to everywhere and look at everywhere eventually, like 10 o'clock at night, I'm in a Walmart on a Friday, and I find a case of them on a pallet. I open the case, I look inside, I just put the entire thing with the store display in my car, take it to the register, I'm just like, yep, give me everything. And he's like, <laughs> I'm nuts, and I'm like, look, man, I got a station wagon with a room in the back, I was buying Zoids at KB a half an hour ago, let's do this, let's make this happen. Nice. And it is one of the greatest little waves ever, because if you are receptive to craziness, uh, seeing Anakin with a communications headset and a bandolier, getting an ARC trooper for the very first time. And Yoda was particularly funny because he has this ridiculous platform, but even more, he's got like a bandolier, like he's some sort of a bandit in Arizona. One of our uh, <laughs> prouder eateries is this place called Chino Bandito Takeyaudi, whose mascot is a panda dressed similarly with a giant mustache and bandoliers. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, it's like Yoda, like a panda. And uh, yeah, that was really exciting just because they did something so outside the box. It seemed like everyone agreed never to speak of it again. That's fun. Um, yeah, it, it, you bring up a good point about those those two packs because you could buy just the standalone figures by themselves, Anakin, Yoda, the Ark Trooper, uh, or at Walmart. If you got lucky enough to find them, I actually never came across them at Walmart. Uh, they were the same the same price, four ninety nine, which just seems like a fluke. I have no idea how or why that happened, but um the only place that i found these two packs were was at kb toys and i know i mentioned to mentioned it to you the other day but this was the first time i ever wrote a check um <laughs> was um at kb toys when i was buying these packs um and i think they were ten dollars there as i recall which you know still i mean you think about five dollars for a figure you know was it, it's really not that bad um and um yeah th these are pretty cool sets and when you, when you look at the packaging of uh, these care these film characters anyway you see um they took like actual images from like attack of the clones and uh, they kind of photoshopped them so that they put all this gear on the characters so that they, they could match what you have in the actual uh, packaging for the toys yeah i thought that was a great idea just because it you know if you didn't know what you were looking into maybe it was from a new movie you didn't know about you know it's a great way to market something make it familiar and uh, not have to hire an illustrator to do a whole new picture from the bottom up which they would go on to do for the uh Unleashed line later, and I did some great artwork for that. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about the packaging for this uh, Clone Wars micro series line? Uh, I appreciate it. it was distinctive, both in the animated and in the non animated look, because you got an explosion on both. It was more white than usual, standard blue at the time. So uh, you had no problem missing the figures on the pegs, which is good and bad depending on who's buying. Because sometimes if a collector has it in their head, oh, this color is not what I want, then they're not even going to look at them, even though. There were figures in the line that would fit in really well with your movie line, including that Wave 3 Super Articulated Clone Trooper, which ended up being the greatest uh, line-changing thing ever. Uh, I'm glad they managed to do something that uh, was distinct and stood out. Um, obviously, it would have been nice if they didn't drag their feet so long on doing something vintage style, because I'm sure you'd be dragging even more people if they did it earlier. But it was uh, cool to see them do something that looked appropriately warlike for a line called Star Wars. Absolutely. Uh, and like you said, it is quite similar. The overall shape and proportions of the packaging are the same as anything that was uh, running at that point uh, with Saga. But, uh, uh, you know, the colors are, are quite different, it's kind of orange and white. And it, it does look like sand or something. Um, so maybe Anakin would, would disapprove of that. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely a fun, um, you know, few waves that they ran. And the ARC Trooper actually did have one variation. So the, the standard ARC Trooper was just white with uh, the light blue markings on it. And uh, I remember being at Walmart one morning. And, you know, at this point, I was very, you know, much into going online and, you know, checking out to see what's, you know, what's new on Rebel Scum and Galactic Hunter. And uh, I just wanted to keep up so that when I went to stores, I could look out for stuff. This is one thing that I did not see anywhere online before I actually saw it in stores. Um, so I was really excited. And I, I started telling people, online like on forums and stuff hey i found this this new arc trooper that has like red markings on it and some of them didn't even believe me <laughs> i had the same problem back when the uh, fruit loops han stormtrooper came out in 1995 just before the new line came out everybody thought it was a load of crap and i remember uh <laughs> it is hard to get people to trust you <laughs> sometimes <laughs> it, it took me a little while to find that red arc trooper but i probably wasted far more gas and time than i should have looking for that <laughs> And, um, you know, it's it's a fun figure. I mean, I, I know it's not anything like the super articulated clone that came a little bit later, but uh, it did have like the ball hinge shoulders and uh, it, from the waist down, it's basically like a statue, but um, it's, uh, you know, you can move the legs a little bit, but uh, I, I thought 
they were pretty fun. Uh, you know, just having a few of them next to each other, kind of cool. And it was so cool to see something every now and again. And this is one area where Star Wars, I think, does consistently let us down, and that's color. Everything is basically earth tones and muted. This is like the most vibrant figure in the entire Clone Wars animated line. Kit Fisto's may be a close second, but you get this bright red figure on a shelf. It really stands out. It looks cool. And in the cartoon, the red arc trooper was the coolest thing on the show that week. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's the kind of thing we'd love to see more of here and there if it makes sense. So I think that you did a good job on that. And, you know, that's why we got a uh, vintage pseudo update a few years later. And that was just as exciting. Absolutely. So I think wave two was Obi-Wan, Dirge, Asajj Ventress, and uh, Mace Windu. Is that correct? That is correct. And uh, that brought you more of the same kind of crazy fun. I remember um, both Dirges were just a little bit different in interesting ways. So it was kind of surprising to me that there was a departure between one implying that maybe he's got human arms and the other one being a suit. Yeah, it's a very interesting looking figure. I do want to talk about Dirge because, uh, well, we, we kind of covered him a little bit. But as far as the figures go, uh, as you noted, there are two versions. There's this one. And then there's also a uh, deluxe line that we'll look at in just a second. But the deluxe one um, was on a, on a bike, a speeder bike. And uh, they look pretty similar, but they're actually a little bit different and this this one here this this single pack figure uh i think as i recall it had a few more accessories and um just the the overall aesthetic of the figure though it it, it kind of looks like I, I always get reminded of of something like a, a cross between a shredder and huh. uh casey jones like i don't know it just it just kind of has like that sort of like sporty look to it or something yeah it's very unlike what you usually expect out of star wars because we usually get a certain kind of a masked hero we don't usually get like a big logo on the belly for most of the figures. It really does feel like it's from a different era, which is handy because it was. And uh, the Bola weapon was kind of cool. The blasters were nice. And bounty hunters were something fans always liked a lot. So it was nice that Lucasfilm put one in there. Uh, it would have been nice if they followed through a little bit more on him. But, it, you know, it, sometimes it's okay to have something just around for a little while and doesn't wear out its welcome. Yeah, definitely. So we also had Asajj Ventress, and this was another interesting one because this is the first uh, time we're seeing this character in uh, Star Wars media. And um, the figure itself uh, at the time I thought was was quite great. Um, she was pretty nicely articulated, and uh, although the, the likeness isn't very similar to what's in the micro series, um, it, it's kind of its own, you know, real world uh, interpretation of the character, kind of like you know anything in this particular uh, subline was, and um, I feel like you know just the lightsabers and you know being able to to uh, holst the hilts in her in her ba around her waist um, was a pretty fun thing to add to this figure. So uh, do you remember finding this one in stores? I uh, at the risk of uh, mentioning someone who may or not you know, be a sponsor, I got it from a, a popular online toy store. Uh, early because I was really lucky back then. Um, but yeah, I, I was very excited when that case showed up. I cracked it right open uh, because we don't get a lot of women in the Star Wars line either. It was just sort of like, wow, now we're up to like, what did this make? Four characters? <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't do a lot. We already had hundreds and hundreds of figures at that point. So, you know, there aren't a lot of bald characters. There aren't a lot of women. Certainly nobody with two lightsabers other than uh, a couple of, an maybe one or two Anakins from Attack of the Clones. Right. It's just really unusual to see a character of this decked out with this many features and a huge cape uh, <laughs> at a price that's really quite reasonable. And she looked a lot more like she did in the comics and the cartoons, but she was still super cool. Looked like she'd seen a couple of good fights and you wanted to know more about her. And thankfully we got to learn a lot more about her over the next 15 plus years. Absolutely. And um, Mace Windu sort of follows the same formula as uh, Obi-Wan or Anakin, Yoda, um, being that, you know, it, the, the costume itself is is a bit reminiscent to what he wears in the films, but it's also been changed a little bit to, um, you know, just look a little more interesting, just to kind of make it a little more differentiated. He's got some armor pieces that snap onto his forearms. Um, and he's got an interesting expression on his face, doesn't he? I thought so. I mean, they really took some interesting liberties with uh, some of these characters in this era, because sometimes you got something that was completely bananas like that 2003 Anakin Skywalker, but at least with Mace Windu, it doesn't look like uh, a mistake was made. It's determination. It's, uh, you know, something you can see he's thinking, which you didn't get a lot of at this time. Uh, you know, you've seen other ones where it's like, I smelled something terrible. But in this <laughs> case, he's clearly going to save the day and do something cool. And 
based on his episode where it was mostly him just fighting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of battle droids, it works. It does. And, uh, you know, you know, it's funny thinking back to that era, you know, saga, Clone Wars, uh, a lot of Mace Windus, they, they really had fun with them, didn't they? Like with the facial expressions. Yeah, the uh, that Attack of the Clones, the one with the Geonosis Arena with his eyes closed and his <laughs> mouth open is one of the strangest head sculpts I've seen that uh, still looks good. I mean, it looks like him. It's still amazing. But it's just so weird because like how many action figures do you get where a character's eyes are both closed and then it sells <laughs> well? I mean, like either I, I can't name another one. It was super weird. And then, of course, the deluxe one that came with the battle droid where he was smiling. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool, too. I mean, that was uh, that was a fun figure. And tracking down the red droid variation only took me forever. So. Oh, wow. Well. Um, and then, uh, you know, going off on a mace tangent here, but then there was also the one from Saga, I think, 2003, that had the lightsaber coming out of his torso. Yeah, that was a really weird one, too. I mean, I, uh, I really love how they experimented with uh, play features because for a toy line, they really don't do a lot to make the toys interesting until basically this line they were just like yeah it's a good action figure and then they start being like well what if we added armor you could snap on well what if we made a joystick well what if you had the force because there's a magnet uh (laughs) not everyone appreciates that but i thought it was cool it is and uh you you know the uh innovations that they made with toys like that it's just kind of like well you know these are toys they are still meant to be fun and you know just it's just cool to see that they tried all these different things you know during this time and um uh, you know, particularly with uh, with Mace, with all these different iterations of him with different portraits that are all over the place. Um, it, it's just pretty cool that they, they actually did that. Yeah, and I hope they uh, consider it in the future. I mean, back in whatever it was, 86, 87, Kenner was coming up with ideas for new beyond the movie toy lines. And I, I think that kind of thing is important because uh, with every franchise, when you start going back a little too far and you don't start moving things forward, you lose people. So even if it's a little strange... Uh, having an opportunity to say, hey, guess what? They have more than one pair of pants. It says something about the future. It's nice to know that people have a closet in the galaxy far, far away. Totally. Um, and then wave three was Kit Fisto, uh, Super Articulated Clone Trooper, and Seisi Tin. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, yeah, so uh, did you ever find this wave on the shelf? I did, uh, but not often. Usually I would see Kit Fistos and an occasional Seisi Tin. I think I might have seen a clone trooper once or twice because I don't think anyone left that on the pegs, especially after, and I hope I'm not misremembering, was the variant foot peg introduced in this packaging or a later wave? Um, Because I know it was in the multi-packs later. I can't remember if they had the foot pegs in the single carded ones or not. But the the main ones didn't have the foot pegs. I guess back then they didn't decide if the foot was uh, deep enough because this is the first ever super articulated action figure for Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, I'm not sure about the foot peg. I, I know that there, that was the difference, but I can't remember if... I, I know that there was a difference in the way it was uh, packaged, like looking here yes. on, on Rebel Scum, like there were two ways that you could see it packaged. Um, up to this point, this was one of the very few figures I never saw in stores. Uh, I did find Kit Fisto, I did find CC Tin, but I never saw the Super Articulated Clone Trooper, and I'm not surprised. Um, but you know, back then, you know, I did live in a small town. We had one target, one Walmart, and that was it. If you wanted to go to the next one, you'd have to drive over a half hour to get there. Um, so, uh, I'm, you know, I'm sure I just missed it by a matter of minutes, but they, as I recall, they didn't restock or at least, uh, you know, I was, I was at the store like at least three times a week back then. And I never saw them restock this wave, uh, or that figure. So it was, it, it was quite a bit later where I actually was able to, uh, to add it to the collection. Yeah, even Target back then, I remember the clearance finds of late 2003 and early 2004 were fantastic. I was getting ridiculous things, 75% off. And it seemed like they were almost getting new cases of some stuff, but maybe they were getting picked over a few minutes before I got there. I remember getting my uh, variant uh, Ellen Sleece Bagano that way. (laughs) And uh, I didn't see this one on clearance. I wish I could have. I would have bought every last one. But thankfully, um, (laughs) we had an opportunity to bring this around again because before I got hired at my current job, I was... uh, tapped to consult on an upcoming clone trooper exclusive for entertainment earth and they were like oh we're gonna go with the uh sculpt for that red one from 2002 and i'm like no no you gotta do this one you gotta do this color and you gotta do this battle damage and i guess there was a lot of back and forth before but like this is a figure that had to be reissued and i'm so happy that they got to reissue it uh and then they reissued it again and again and they could probably reissue it again it would still sell really well and it's been i guess this makes it 14 years old this year no wait 16 years old this year 
Yeah, 16. Oh, oh. gosh. Wow. Oh, yeah. oh, my goodness. Um, where does the time go? <laughs> um, so, yeah, so Kid Fisto and uh, Stacey Tin. So Kid Fisto doesn't have a shirt. He's uh, he's, he's very muscular. And um, he doesn't have shoes on. Uh, it's a very aquatic looking uh, Kid Fisto. Um, but this one kind of had some sort of feature, didn't it? Where it was kind of meant to look like it was swimming. Yeah, you can tell that his tentacles are flowing just a little bit. And uh, I appreciate that they gave him the ankles too. So if you put him on his belly or something, you could look like he's kicking. Yeah, that that's fun. I love that. Uh, and then Stacey Tin looks like he's been through heck and back. He's uh, <laughs> missing half of his horn and... Uh, he looks very, uh, he looks very worn out. Yeah, I thought he looked really cool because he was super gruff. They gave him these big old mitts. Uh, the outfit looks like they changed it a little bit in terms of color and everything. And they gave him this great wipe on his head. So the horns and the skin bring out a lot of extra detail. Uh, sculpting the detail has never really been a problem for Hasbro. but And we've seen this to this very day. Uh, bringing it out with paint can be a challenge, especially when you have something the size of a peanut. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and they did a really good job with this one because you can tell all the extra color and it really brings out a, a gruff, grim expression on a character that we don't really get to see more than a couple of seconds in the movie is basically a rubber mask. So they did a really nice job in the cloth, lower robes. They're a little weird, but I like that they were movable so you could put them in a vehicle if you wanted to. Totally. Um, so let's look at the deluxe figures that were part of the Clone Wars Micro Series uh, realistic line. So there's three of them. Uh, there's a clone trooper oh, who's on... To, to be that annoying guy. Uh <laughs> Uh, the photo archive in question has multi-packs and deluxe figures as separate things, but they all ship in the same case. Ah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Maybe for the sake of just differentiating them in the archive, they have them separate here. But Yeah, I mean, I uh, again, I got the waves as cases. So when they came in, I was like, oh, yeah, you get this one and this one. I was like, well, why'd you split them up? I mean, obviously, there's probably a good reason. But uh, yeah. they were really good at uh, delivering on... The promise, because I was at this press event at Hasbro, and they were like, well, we wanted to do something kind of like Army Men, so we gave you three <laughs> figures for $10, but they're better than Army Men. And I'm like, yes, they are. But uh, tracking those clone troopers down, all the variations, that was not easy. That was that's, that was not easy. Let's talk about that, because so, <laughs> so basically what they did is uh, this was a, a pretty new concept at the time. They were trying to give us Army Builders. Um, they weren't super articulated. They're basically pre-posed. Uh, they have very limited articulation. Um, but the standard pack, I think, was just three white clone troopers, right? You had like a, a kneeling one, you had a standing one, and then you had one that was laying down. But they actually offered a you know variants where you could find packs uh, that feature the uh, officers in there. Like one pack would have like the red striped officer, the captain. Another one had the yellow officer. Um, I think that was the commander. Uh, and then the other one had the blue, and then the other one had the green. So if you wanted to get all of the variations, you had to buy this set four times over. Five times over, I think. I could be wrong about that, because uh, there's four molds, and each mold has two different colors. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, if you got the all-white set, yeah, that would that would be five times yeah. over. The all-white might be duplicates, and forgive me if I'm totally wrong, because I cannot remember, and this has been a while. But uh, they're really neat, and uh, it was the first time I think I've seen Hasbro really go for that just different enough to make you mad thing like oh you want everything okay it's gonna cost you and it's like they could have done them all in you know three packs if they really wanted to but they spread them out and uh they were difficult to get like the green and the yellow ones i think i had to get off of ebay later the blue one i saw occasionally the red one i saw occasionally and the white one was around but uh it was a creative way to fill out your gunships and other vehicles at a relatively decent price plus these didn't sell as fast as the other ones Absolutely. I think I got mine off eBay too, the yellow, the yellow set, um, uh, you know, eBay 16 years ago. So I've been using eBay a while. You have too. <laughs> um, I just looked at mine. I created my account in 98 and I'm just like, holy cow. Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> so let's see. There's So these were pretty cool. Uh, and you make a really good point. They were awesome for decking out your gunship, which, you know, had only been released the year before, I think, or was it in... Was it in 03 or 02? No, it was 02, uh, but they did bring it back in 03. They did. So we'll, we'll get there in just a little bit. Um, so another set that is a multi-pack was the Jedi. So I thought this one was super cool. What did you think about the three-pack with the Jedi? I was really excited that they managed to bring out something we didn't get to see very much, which was completely new characters. And uh, they were oddly specific 
and generic all at once because you got a Rodian Jedi who at the time had no name in canon that I could recall, uh, a distinctive blue uh, Twi'lek and a human in a hood. And here they are. Have fun with them. I mean, that was... Uh, it's not something you usually got with Star Wars. Typically, there's a backstory, there's a novel. They're going to tell you who this is. Maybe not right away. You know, maybe you have to wait for the movie. But in this case, they were just like, they're toys. Have at it. They're fun. And uh, I, I like that a lot. And I kind of hope they do some more stuff like that when it makes sense. But we got to see a little bit of that with uh, clone troopers over the years. And uh, obviously, Mandalorians back in that exclusive set in 2007, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um I I think it was cool to do, and I'm kind of surprised they didn't do more of it because they could have just easily done this set with very hidden heads like six times over. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was interesting, and I think these are perfect for... I know in the last episode we talked about the uh, the Arena playset. Um, uh, th- these are the perfect kind of figures that you'd probably want to round out in there. You know, just random Jedi that, you know, just could kind of be in the background doing their own thing. Um, but I thought they were pretty cool. I thought that the sculpts on them on the heads were, were pretty nice. Not so much the human, maybe he's, he's very generic. But the the tree like Jedi and then the Rodian, uh, I thought they were pretty fun. Yeah, and again, like for ten bucks, if you compare these to the four ninety nine Saga figures, they're pretty comparable because the Nikto Jedi only had a couple points of articulation too. He didn't have anything from the waist down. So basically, you were getting something a little different at a pretty good price and. Uh, Bargain Hunters, certainly, this is a great era to be a Star Wars fan because we had a price drop from the six ninety nine for Episode 1, and now you're getting three figures for $10, which I assume we will never see again. Hmm. <laughs> I, I think you might be right there. Um, so there was also a droid army pack, and this one had a super battle droid, a red battle droid, and a destroyer droid. Uh, and these were kind of similarly not too functional, as I recall. Yeah, uh, the the destroyer droid in particular was a little lacking, uh, but the battle droid and the super battle droid, if you need someone to stand around in your arena and get shot at, perfect. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, but, you know, really, really cool that, you know, they were very focused on giving you all aspects of Clone Wars, you know, your clones, your Jedi, your droids. Um, so they did a good job with that. Um, so another weird set was the uh, destroyer droid battle launcher. And this one was... Uh, it was different because, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just a really weird thing. When you look at it, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But uh, so you have a you have two battle you two destroyer droids, but they're supposed to be the same droid, I guess. Um, or I guess they don't have to be. It just depends on your imagination. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's kind of like a little mechanism, right? And then it launches out the spinning uh, destroyer droid. I'd have this weird little like cloth belt to launch it, not like a spring-loaded thing like we usually get, or something that involves gravity. Mm. Um, and Hasbro's pretty good at projectiles. They've come up with lots of cool ways to have something shoot over the years, and this seemed a little less exciting. And, uh, you know, you got the slug figure of the wheel droidica and the one that doesn't really move. I found that a little disappointing because Hasbro was also doing Transformers, and this was just after they did Beast Wars, and they proved they can do you know, a, a cheetah into a robot, and there's some cheats in there, but it looks pretty good. And seeing something like this, I'm sure, you know, it's cheaper, but compared to other three packs in the line, this one, I appreciate what it was, but it wasn't their best work. <laughs> yeah, I remember that seemed to be the consensus back then, too, was like, okay, this is kind of strange. Um, there's other options for destroyer droids out there, you know, that are a little bit better. Um, so I mentioned uh, earlier that there were three other uh, de- deluxe sets, and these are more uh, vehicle-oriented. So the first one is a clone trooper that is on a speeder bike. Um, this was actually a repaint of one of the deluxe sets from the Saga line, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. They uh, they do what I love them to do best, and that is to add more junk to it. And they gave him a rocket launcher. He still has that uh, grenade, and uh, the helmet comes off, and some of the armor does too. There's no good reason for it to, but it does, and I appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's fun. I, uh, it, it, there's really, like you said, no need for it to have removable armor, but the fact that it does just kind of differentiates a little bit from any of the other clones that you already have. And, of course, it had sort of that throwing sort of action feature where it could throw that little, I don't know, what do you want to call that, a grenade or something? I think it was like a proton grenade or something, but don't quote yeah, me on that. that. That sounds about right. I'll, we'll go with proton grenade. Uh, and then, yeah, I, I really liked how they painted this one white. For whatever reason, I just thought it looked kind of cool. It matched the gunship. Yeah, it looked really great. You had the dirty boots on the clone. And 
you know, it's it was nice to see give them getting the most use of some of these vehicle modes. And I don't think anybody got their fill of that uh, first release from Attack of the Clones either. So it was nice to see it again. Definitely. Um, do you remember the spider droid with rotating turret and firing cannon? Oh, yes, I do, because Hasbro was having a great, uh, very short renaissance on wind-up toys. Because they also had <laughs> Zoids out at the same time. And I was a fan of Zoids, because I loved them when they were in America when I was a little kid. So, and they're yes. like, we're going to do more wind-up stuff in Star Wars. I'm like, yes, you are. And I'm going to buy them. <laughs> this is great. And uh, it didn't hold a candle to the other toys in terms of, like, what you got in the box. But, like, it was a giant, goofy mosquito robot with four <laughs> legs and a wind-up motor. And it shoots rockets out of its nose. This is great. It is. It is pretty cool. And, you know, we did see this in the film, too. So, it, you know, this was something that was kind of kind of necessary to have, I, I feel like. And uh, if you want to torment your pet, there's no better toy to use than this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can annoy your cat with it. It's always good. Absolutely. Uh, so then the other dirge that was available in the line we that we alluded to earlier was uh, this one that comes on the speeder bike. Uh, and, and, and again, you know, I want to reiterate that these sets were nine ninety eight, but you got a, a nice figure and a pretty decently sized uh, vehicle, uh, which was which was pretty cool. Um, so, do you want to talk a little bit about how this dirge was different from the original? I thought it was great because they managed to give you something so much preposterously better. I can't even imagine why they did both, because uh, the dirge had the covered arms instead of the fleshy arms in the bike set so it was a little bit truer to his media appearances he had elbow joints he had knee joints he had the thing so he can joust it's this big green bike with all these little markings on it uh the bike itself probably could have sold for 10 bucks without too much of a fight the super articulated dirge was oh sorry it was close to super articulated it wasn't quite super articulated but it was one of the most articulated figures of its era it didn't have quite as much paint as the individually carded figure but it was just a little bit less and i think Especially then, most fans would be willing to trade a couple of paint apps for articulation. And uh, for the price of two figures, you get a better articulated dirge and a huge bike that really filled up the packaging. And, of course, some assembly is required. Uh, I, with that Lansing scene and everything, everybody was kind of hoping we'd get more of the IG Lancer droids with their bikes. We got the Lancer droid eventually. I don't think we ever got a bike in any action figure format. But um, you get what you can. And it's nice sometimes that we get something like this from an episode of something that was basically there to be a brief marketing stunt and get you thinking <laughs> about Star Wars for a year. And uh, yeah, it's kind of, it's good and it's bad that you can probably still get this pretty cheap. Yeah, I think several of these you can probably get fairly inexpensively still. Yeah, and uh, obviously I'd highly recommend collecting the entire Clone Wars line because it's a small line and everything in it's pretty cool and most of the stuff they never bothered to remake. 100%. And especially if you're a lover of toys, you know, maybe, you know, somebody who's only into super articulated, highly detailed action figures wouldn't appreciate these as much. But somebody that, you know, really likes toys and, you know, seeing the evolution of how these lines change over the years uh, would probably especially be appreciative of these. Oh, yeah. I mean, I would say Clone Wars in particular is a missing link uh, in the evolution of the line because 2002 to 2004, you really saw them playing with everything an action figure for Star Wars could be because you saw. Some that were kind of like statues, some that had more action features and magnets and uh, spring-loaded swinging attacks that we didn't see before. And then they said, well, what if we put three figures in a box? What if we gave it a big vehicle? Uh, and what did people gravitate toward? Um, it was nice to see. And this line, while small, encompassed pretty much every aspect of that for some of the better prices I think we ever saw in the entire line. I mean, this is the last time it was ever this cheap to collect. Yeah, it, 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 it's pretty crazy looking back on it, those prices. I'm, I'm envious of that era. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's look at vehicles. Uh, there were a few different vehicles, mid-range, and then uh, there was a larger vehicle. So if we look at the mid-range assortment, uh, these retailed in 1999. Uh, one of, the first one that we have is Anakin's Jedi Starfighter. So this was quite different from the Starfighter that we saw in Attack of the Clones. It was different from the one that was released during the Saga line. Um, so this is kind of a modified version of uh, Anakin's Jedi Starfighter. I think that's actually what it's called, the modified Jedi Starfighter. That's right. And uh, I was lucky enough to see Mark Boudreau talk about it. And he was like, OK, so like Anakin's a tinkerer. So we decided to give him like a hot rod Starfighter. So this is what he would do. He'd get this part from this and this part from that. 
and we put these cannons on the wing so it looks kind of like an x-wing and he was going over and i'm like that's really cool and then a lot of the other collector <laughs> sites guys were there like oh, what the hell is this and i'm just <laughs> like i can't wait to play with this because you have the astromech uh in the middle of the ship and if i remember correctly that's what activated the proton torpedo uh it just looked like a real big goofy toy and I am a ridiculous fan of mini rigs and weird contraptions based on vehicles from the movie. I am looking at the Cap 2 and MTV7 on my desk right now. Uh, but they're great. And this is one of those ships that uh, it just gave you something to do and showed a little bit more imagination. Like, what would the prototype for the next generation of Jedi Starfighters look like? Nothing like this, but hey, it was a good inspiration. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a really fun looking ship. And I'm trying to remember if this actually made an appearance in the micro series, but I can't remember. I believe it did for sure on what was the one where Anakin that was got to be season late season, late part of the first batch because Anakin met Asajj Ventress in the oven four. I think mm. this is the one that got blew up on that or was yeah. it the other one? Yeah, I think you might be right about that. I yeah. haven't seen it in a while. Yeah, it's it's been forever. Speaking of that episode, I love when the rain was coming down and hitting his lightsaber and just sizzling. <laughs> yeah, it's the kind of thing. It's just like, oh, it's so cool. It's like, no, they can't do it in the movie because you did it. But that was so cool. <laughs> um, so the next one that we have here is the Armored Assault Tank. Uh, this was, wasn't anything really new. Um, so if, if you were collecting the episode one line, you would have seen this before. But, you know, they brought it back. Uh, which made sense because I believe it was featured in the uh, the micro series, and um, you, you know if you're if you're building out the theme of Clone Wars, it makes sense to have you know our, all the artillery and uh, you know vehicles that uh, would would play into that whole theme. So that's basically what this was. And it made sense to bring it back too because the uh, Phantom Menace version of the tank was kind of hard to get. I didn't see it around very much because it was a year two product, and by the time year two Phantom Menace came around. Uh, people had strong opinions about the Phantom Menace and whether or not they wanted to buy anything else from it. And uh, Hasbro did tweak this one just barely by changing the interior pilot droid to kind of a rusty red color instead of the tan color. Hmm. So um, if you want to build out an army, it still looks pretty much the same as a tank goes. And I, I always thought this was a really great ship because they had some really cool interior bits. Like when you pop off that panel in the front, they etched all this detail and tech into the inside of that blast off panel. Mm -hmm. They had this, trapdoor droid that could flip over and the thing got shot you could have the droid pilot fly out and they had a place for the gunner it was a real toy vehicle with wheels and fire rockets and the whole bit and uh again i got a tour <laughs> from mark Boudreau, so like you know seeing him talk about every single feature was like this thing's amazing and everyone else is like i don't like battle droids i'm like no you don't understand how cool this is and, uh, <laughs> yeah i i think it's great and they repainted it 90 times so i've I've got enough of them now, but back then it was still exciting to see the second ever release of the Armored Assault Tank. Yeah, totally. And looking at the picture here, it, it looks quite a bit like the one they, they put out in 2012 as well. Like the colors are very similar. Yeah, they just, sometimes it's a little bit lighter, sometimes it's a little bit darker. I'm sure like the blast mark was changed just enough that if you put them side by side, maybe there's a difference. I don't think I've done that, but I should. Um, but it's nice that they keep some of these things in circulation. Although now I'm sure we're in an era where we're probably never going to see this again either. Yeah, I, uh, unfortunately, I think that's true. Um, so we also have a Geonosian fighter. This one was something we did see in Attack of the Clones. Uh, don't recall if it was in Clone Wars micro series or not, but uh, it was cool that they gave us a toy of it because we hadn't had it up to this point. Yeah, I thought it was really cool. Um, this is one of the toys where, well, there were a couple of these, but it starts to become more and more obvious that Safety and the tiny tots were starting to ruin my fun because the nose on this thing, this dual nosed thing, uh, was made of a rubbery plastic that tended to sag with time and heat. Like on the uh, Power FX X Wing from 1998, the wings would sag. Mm. So you got to be careful over time because depending on how you store it, they might get warped. Um, but it was still really cool. And you had the exclusive pilot figure. And back then, we didn't get a lot of exclusive pilot figures still. Right. Uh, the figure fit in there, it shot a rocket, and uh, yeah, you, know, you get to see a Geonosian with clothes on because that 2002 figure went around without pants, so it was indecent. <laughs> this one, he knows how to go outside, or she, or it, or they, I don't know. But regardless, the bug person is able to fly, and I think, if I remember correctly, the lore was they steer by scent, which I thought was fascinating. Huh, I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, huh, interesting. Um, I don't think they ever reissued this, did they? No, I mean, this is like a one-and-done thing, and uh, to be honest with you, I have no idea what it goes for. I mean... Most one-and-done vehicles tend to shoot up because people like vehicles, and there's not... It's not like Darth Vader where there's like 40 of them. Mm -hmm. You get one or two, and that's it. And if you miss it, you miss it. Um, but yeah, it, it's cool. It's fun. 
uh, I only got the one. I always kind of thought I should have got another one or two, but seeing how big the line got, nah, I'm glad I just got the one. <laughs> totally. Um, so this one's one of my favorites, the Hellfire Droid. That was cool. And they recolored this one quite a few times, too. Yeah, this one is... Uh, so this this one's crazy. <laughs> uh, it has 32 missiles on uh, on top of the droid. And then it has these really huge wheels. This is something from, from uh, episode two. Um, but it has these really huge wheels with rubber, like on the on the tread, and uh, you know you can roll it around. It's got like a chin gun that swivels. But those thirty two missiles, if you wanted to go crazy, and I, trust me, I did this a few times. You know, <laughs> you'd insert all of them, and then you just hit them like with your hand really quick, and uh, you'd throw all thirty two missiles out at whatever you're firing <laughs> at. I thought it was a great toy, and I just had to be careful to set it up so I wouldn't. Uh, cause sometimes those spring loaded rockets have a mind of their own, and they just kind of <laughs> go. So I think I had to have them like partially in there because I didn't want them to like attack me in the middle of the night or something. But I love the big hoop wheels. It looked unlike anything else we've ever seen. Um, it also started a kind of short trend where we got a couple of things that were vehicles, but you couldn't actually put an action figure inside them in any way. So they couldn't interact with the three and a quarter inch figure line, but they were more or less scaled to the figure line, which was not wrong, but it, it did take a play feature away that I always appreciated. Yeah, yeah, it's... Yeah, it's it's funny. I, I gotta dig this one out. It, it it's it's just a it's a load of fun. I, I'd be afraid to shoot these missiles now. That they'd, they'd probably go everywhere and I'd lose them. <laughs> yeah, there's a, a carpet somewhere just gonna eat them like a Brea carpet. <laughs> right. Um, so there's a Jedi Starfighter as well. This one's kind of a unique coloration. I don't know that they release this one again, but it's basically the episode two Starfighter just uh, repainted in um, like kind of like a blue and white color. Yeah, I mean, they just uh, changed uh, the one color in the droid a little bit, and the end results were, uh, at first, it was like, wow, another Jedi Starfighter, that's refreshing. And I want to say I got, like, eight or nine recolors of this thing over the years, because between Kit Fisto, AC-10, <laughs> uh, Ayla Secura, no, wait, no, that was the uh, F3 Starfighter style, but they went to town repainting this thing for years and years and years, and, uh, you know, this is where it all got started. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so then we move on to the big gun, uh, ship that was available, a big vehicle in this in this line. And uh, that's the Command gunship. So this is a repaint of the Republic gunship from the year prior. And um, I, I know you talk about this sometimes, but we got to mention the price. How much does this cost? At the time, it was fascinating because it was 10 bucks cheaper. The Attack of the Clones release was 40 and this was 30 and I remember when Hasbro was sending around the prices and stuff, I'm like, is this a typo? And they're like, no. And I'm like, why is it $10 cheaper? Because <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense. Cause they didn't take anything out. Uh, there's no reason. I mean, it's a big toy. And in that era, we were seeing a lot more price increases. Price decreases were very uncommon in action figure lines because I'd say by about 2000, the idea of a $4.99 action figure was almost completely in the past. When you see a vehicle this big for 30 bucks. Even though it doesn't have electronics, that's still amazing because you get these, uh, basically push a button and these doors swing out. You have uh, firing uh, guns in the front. You got these bombs. You got these huge, long, pencil-sized rockets coming out of the top. You get a dropping uh, carrier platform for your troops. You get a lot. And uh, the only, well, it's pretty much the same toy except black is red and red is black. So it was great. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's It's wild. I mean... Um, I know we were talking not too long ago about the Vintage Collection Republic gunship. Um, that one, I, I just I've seen a couple in recent weeks sell for northward of five hundred dollars. It, it, yeah, it's insane. It's, uh, yeah, it's weird because I remember back in the old old days, uh, this didn't quite happen with this one, but like when the original Kenner Star Wars stuff, the twelve inch figures from seventy eight seventy nine were the first things to shoot up. Immediately following them were the vehicles, and those skyrocketed. And then the three and a quarter action figures took a few years before they started to get expensive. And it seems like we're kind of seeing the same thing here, where uh, people are willing to pay for vehicles just because there aren't as many. A complete collection of vehicles is theoretically possible to put together. Uh, action figures, if you weren't doing it as you went along, I, I wouldn't wish it on you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty crazy that they were able to deliver that at that at that price. And 
Um, you know, if you already had, you know, the previous gunship, there wasn't really a whole lot of reason to, to get this one unless, you know, you're collecting them all, which, you know, a lot of us, you know, were and are. Um, but uh, I think so- somebody had actually done a, like customized this one a little bit further and turned it into like an Imperial gunship, as I recall. Yeah, they uh, they did some really neat alternate decos between the TV shows and fan stuff. And we got so many of these things and they could probably keep it going. But I, I hope someone at Hasbro eventually just said, like, you know, we sold the same vehicle to people 10 times. Maybe we want to dial it back a bit because their closet's probably getting kind of full. Yeah, yeah, I would tend to agree. So uh, since that pretty much wraps up the realistic uh, micro series line, if you could pick one action figure from this line and say, this is my favorite, which would it be? I know the technical best answer is that clone trooper, but eh, that red arc trooper, that was the one I had the most fun with. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that 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 that's still a cool one. It's interesting. I don't know about the ones that you have, but in mine, uh, in my collection, I have I have some of those, uh, you know, the both versions. And then they also repainted it for that um, uh, Clone Wars uh, battle pack set several years later. Uh, those ones actually yellowed quite a bit, but these original ones didn't. Hmm. Yeah, I've seen there was some really weird stuff with the white plastic, especially in the 2002-2003 era. Some of the yellowing and greening uh, is real discoloration of the plastic, but some of it is sort of an oily film. So if you have access to a product called uh, the Mr. Clean Magic Eraser or its uh, store brand knockoff, you can actually get the oil off with some of these things. The only catch is if it gets anywhere but the white stuff, it might scrape the paint. you got to be real careful. But uh, on a lot of those white figures from that era... I cleaned them right up, and uh, they, they're not getting when they call them magic. I, I use the same thing on my Converse sneakers to get the dirt off the white bars. They're, they're, they're a lifesaver. Tricks of the trade. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I should be like going on some home sh- morning show, like, you know, <laughs> Miss Manners type thing or something. <laughs> That's, that'd be hilarious. Um, okay, so I think if I had to pick one, I, I'm going to go with the Saj Ventress. That's a good show. Um, yeah, I, I just think she's a fun figure. I mean, she looks really cool. I really like the cape. It's it's very detailed looking. And, um, you know, I mentioned how you can holster lightsaber hilts in her around her waist. I think that's that's just very fun. And then, you know, the fact that she does have two red lightsabers, you know, she's pretty striking, like if you put her up on the shelf. And uh, I think for the most part, uh, you know, they haven't done a ton of realistic uh, Asajj Ventress figures over the years. There's maybe like two or three of them. But uh, I, I think that this one, in my view, is still probably like the, the definitive one. Yeah, I think she's really great. And uh, we did get the realistic cartoon style one in 2005. Yeah. But little things like uh, eyeballs. Very nice. I appreciate them. <laughs> yeah, those are important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So let's look at the animated uh, series. So this was a small line. I mean, it was a very small segment within all of this. So. Um, As you noted earlier, they basically wanted to recreate what you see on the screen uh, in action figure form. So it's a little bit different from the um, regular micro series line, which is based on realistic uh, interpretations. This is actually, these look like they stepped right off the screen. And uh, there were maybe like a few, was it two or three waves that they released for this? Uh, There were two waves up front that were originally uh, exclusive to Target. And then they got a wide release later. And then... uh... In 2005, they did season three or series three, I can't remember what it said on the sticker, with some more clone troopers and a couple of more figures, and uh, there were a couple of multi-packs to flesh it out, and it was a pretty good overall line. I mean, for a limited series, we got more action figures than we got from the Ewoks and Droids cartoons combined, which I'm still bitter about, but who knows what we can make about that happen someday. Right, yeah. <laughs> um yeah, these are interesting. So the the retail that it's showing here is six ninety nine, and I seem to kind of remember that was one complaint people had was, you know, these barely move. Why are we paying you know a few dollars more than you know just a regular figure? Um, do you think that they cost more to produce, or were they just trying to see what they could squeeze out of collectors? Uh, it gets complicated. Sometimes you get to hear stories about things and. Uh, but they did package an extra stand in, which you didn't always get stands in the uh, Clone Wars line. True. Uh, and uh, we did get more deco on a lot of these figures than we usually got. But uh, yeah, at the expense of articulation, so there were fewer parts. It wouldn't surprise me if these could have cost the same. But every now and again, we see when a retailer gets an exclusive, it might be an extra dollar. And it is going to sell. And uh, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. I mean, just now we're seeing... Uh, a brand new retro Grand Moff Tarkin packaged with a $20 board game 
And that's probably the only thing that's going to stop it from being snapped up because people have to choke on a board game to get the figure. And sometimes <laughs> you put an extra dollar or two on the figure just to keep them all from selling to the first guy who walks in the store. Yeah, that that that, that makes sense. I could I could buy that. Um, so they got their main staples out of the way pretty early on. There was like Anakin, uh, Obi Wan, Yoda, uh, Dooku, Mace Windu. Uh, there's Dirge again, uh, plain clone trooper. Um, the clone trooper is available in different colors. Uh, did they make variations of the single packed clone, or were these uh, only available through the multi packs? The uh, red, yellow, and blue clones were all available in that uh, season series three whatever package in two thousand five, and I took a long time to be able to find those because those were the first ones to go, and it seemed they were randomly inserted depending on the case, so they were kind of de facto chase figures. Uh, mm -hmm. The white one was available up front and was pretty easy to get, but if you wanted the uh, the captain, the commander, and the lieutenant, uh, you were basically going to be needing to hunt. And thankfully, on eBay a few years ago, somebody had a lot of all of them for like 10 bucks with a couple of other figures I already had. And I'm just like, yeah, just give me that. I'll take them. And uh, the great thing about Star Wars is if your attention span is longer than that of your average collector, you might be able to get what you missed cheap. And I certainly did with these. Nice. Yeah, I don't think I even focused on getting the variants because... Um, I mean, I enjoyed these. I think I appreciate these more now than I did back then, but um, I did buy some of them and I feel like at the time I didn't think I needed all the clone variants. Um, so I did get the regular white one, but I don't think I got any of the others. Um, but then we have also uh, a few others that were released. I'm not sure which was wave one and which was wave two. I feel like maybe if, it, if they're organizing it here by wave on Rebel Scum's website, that it was uh, Anakin, Asajj, uh, Mace, and Obi-Wan. Is that, does that sound correct? Sure. Yeah, I, I have it written down <laughs> somewhere, but uh, yeah, I, I don't have my old stuff handy. Yeah, so that was, uh, those were in the in the line. There was also a uh, Dooku, Dirge, and there's another Anakin. This one actually is based off of the uh, the battle where he's fighting Asajj Ventress on, on a Yavin. And uh, it looks like he's got her lightsaber. Is that is that what that is, the red one? Yeah, that was part of that super cool battle where uh, he was not able to hang on to his lightsaber, so he uh, improvised. And you get a great grim expression on his face. His hair is all matted down because of the rain, and he looks angry. I mean, he looks really angry, and the face just looks like it came out of a classic Warner Brothers cartoon. It's really expressive, and he had these great whites around his eyes. Uh, it was one of those figures you look at, and yeah, it cost a little bit more, but you can tell it just felt like something more went into it. And the interest is a little bit more specialized at that point too. Clone Wars right before Revenge of the Sith came out was not something a lot of people were that interested in. Mm -hmm. So he kind of stuck around a little bit in some areas, but uh, man, that was a great figure. Yeah, it, it, it is. And you, you mentioned the expression on it's pretty awesome. And I think that's one of the things about this animated line is that, um, you know, the, the figures do are pretty expressive. Uh, and that is captured very well, uh, as if they they did step off the animation into a uh, you know plastic form. Um, so you know they did a really good job on those. Anybody that's listening that hasn't uh, checked these out or seen them before, I mean, definitely give them a look because uh, it's pretty cool what Hasbro did back in the day. Yeah, yeah, and they were really cheap too because they even did these great multi packs over the years. And uh, I remember Walmart had the last multi packs for this line. Each one had. Three new figures that were based on existing tooling, but they changed the head here, they changed the deco there. Never saw them at Walmart, but I got them in a comic book shop a couple of years later for a fraction of the price. And uh, everyone else's lack of interest can be your gain. You can get something really cool, have a complete set on your desk, maybe put it together a cool shadow box with name tags or something, and it ain't going to cost you a lot. Absolutely. Very good advice. Um, and yeah, those, those three packs were great value. I mean, $10, you're getting three figures. And that was something that they did really well for a long time. Uh, I think from the DVD release through the Blu-ray release, they periodically, uh, and for the film releases too, um, Hasbro would give Walmart these uh, sets that had three figures. And there sometimes there'd be like two or three different sets that you'd have to track down to get them all uh, for each line. But uh, yeah, that was one thing I really appreciated of, of, you know, within that time frame, them doing these, these three packs, you know, for $10 and sometimes they weren't, they weren't the best figures, but <laughs> you know, the value was totally there. Yeah. And that's something that, uh, you kind of need is something, a, a good low priced ambassador to get people interested because if people won't make that first purchase, they're not going to make a second one. And, uh, back in the day, Hasbro said one of their investor calls, so like with Phantom Menace, they realized at six ninety nine kids weren't buying 
multiple figures. They were buying one figure. Mm. So when they would do something like this, it's like, well, you've already got three. You can certainly go to four to five to six. It's all about getting that first uh, handshake with the line, and that keeps you interested. But if you don't buy the first one, there's not going to be uh, any longevity. And right now, I'm wondering how much longevity we've got. But, you know, everything new coming out seems to be selling okay. There just isn't that much new to buy. So, um, Adam, if you had to pick one figure uh, in the animated uh, series here from the animated um, looking figures uh, that you would say is your favorite, which would it be? It's hard to pick. Uh, that Yoda's really, but that Asajj Ventress is so cool. I mean, it's one of the things where I would say just buy them all, except for the fact that the uh, display stands versus gravity, the, the legs are a little bit thinner <laughs> on some of these. So Anakin's tend to fly forward over time, which I don't care for. But it almost doesn't matter because they look so awesome. And they're so much cheaper than the General Giant statues were. Yeah, that, that is for sure. Um, yeah, they're all really cool. Uh, I think Asajj, as you note, is a highlight. Uh, Grievous is certainly a highlight. And um, uh, even the Ark Trooper, once again, is, is a pretty cool looking, pretty cool looking figure. Oh, yeah. I mean, they really captured the personality. Like, everybody got a cool battle pose. And uh, that used to be a dirty word in collector circles. They didn't want pre-posed things that you couldn't play with but since these guys weren't going to be doing any sitting anyway you may as well go for it lean into it and you get so many things that are ready to duel or ready to duke it out on your desk and you know if you didn't want to spend all day trying to get the gravity just right that came out of the box pretty much okay except for again anakin over a couple of months he's going to fall over but everybody else it's fine absolutely um so adam do you think that this uh, clone wars micro series uh, either of these two t- uh, sub toy lines uh, have had any lasting uh, legacy or impact on all the stuff that's come since then? I definitely think it's got people's attention on what you could do because after Shadows of the Empire gave you the whole movie without a movie thing, the Clone Wars really brought it up. And uh, I guess the biggest, most obvious legacy is we got a whole nother Clone Wars show. Like people liked it so much to go, how about we expand it even more? Yeah. Um, keeping this sort of thing going, it put the characters and p- figures uh, in people's hands. Asajj Ventress got to have much longer life because of stuff like this all the jedi got to have more attention it brought more clones to market in an era where we really were starved for clone figures um really just gave people a reason to like the prequels and it's hard to say how everybody feels about it now but back then it wasn't easy to find people who were like yeah i really like that last battle in the back of the clones just everybody was just like (laughs) so the clone wars i think made good on a lot of the promises of what star wars could and should be it made it really fun and uh just having a big old battle royale with everybody you know and love and a couple of new guys just it brought star wars to a level that was a little bit more uh, accessible fun and frankly colorful because you get to see you get the bright orange commander cody grievous went through some recolors over the years uh, in the line too each version was a little bit different and all those brightly colored clone troopers were super cool too Yeah, couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, A really interesting little line. And uh, just looking back on it, uh, you know, we didn't really have a whole lot other than the Star Wars films uh, to go off of in terms of toys. And uh, the fact that they did create this animated series to kind of keep us interested in Star Wars during this uh, three year gap between films. Um, It's a lot different than what we have now. And it's... um, it was nice. It was it was a good way to satiate, you know, people's appetites for Star Wars and uh, introduce something new at the same time that, uh, you know, it did end up, as you noted, being very popular. And they did bring the Clone Wars a few years later. And, uh, you know, that that obviously, of course, is a whole other beast. But yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this is probably the last we're going to see of this line. They kind of demoted it in terms of its uh, officialness you know, the events and telling things. Right. But at the time, this was fantastic, and they got to tell the opening crawl to Revenge of the Sith with a cartoon battle, and I really hope they consider doing something like this again between movies, uh, either as a prequel before the new thing comes out or something to keep us interested until the next one, because right now it just kind of feels like they're not letting us play with our characters outside the movies quite so much, and I think denying fans the ability to really expand their imagination and you know, what's Count Dooku doing on the weekend? You know, oh, he's got a, you know, great planet where he goes and fights with this cat lady person and <laughs> there's all these gladiators and stuff. And now oh, look, Dulox. I mean, they just put stuff into this show left and right that uh, really did help expand what Star Wars was at the time. We've expanded a lot more since then, but having that little 
glimpse into things is kind of great. You know, we're just expanding on The Force Awakens, but I'm beyond The Force Awakens now. I want something after Last Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I do too. I do too. It's 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 a little bit empty, despite all the content that we have for Star Wars these days. That that is something that is a little bit lacking. Um, and uh, I, I do want to note also here that we did get more from this series as the years went on. Not a whole lot, but occasionally we get a figure here and there or a vehicle um, that is tied into. Uh, the Clone Wars micro series, so it didn't it didn't completely die off once this line ended. Uh, we they did sprinkle a few things here and there. Yeah, yeah, and it was great to see stuff even up to uh, the vintage collection when we got the uh, Arc Trooper Commander with the variant uh, armor bits you could swap around. Especially since Hasbro repeatedly said they would never make that figure for <laughs> at least two or three years before its release. Yeah, and that that is a fantastic figure as well. Um, but even even in the present, like we have the, the upcoming Black Series um, six inch uh, Obi Wan Kenobi that's based off of the micro series, so uh, we're still seeing the impact of this show all these years later. People love it. I mean, congratulations, Walgreens and Steve. You know, the toy buyer for Walgreens. He picked another. One. I'm gonna be in your store constantly again. So good job. <laughs> yeah, can't wait for that one. Um, well, yeah. So Adam, do you have any uh, final thoughts on on Clone Wars micro series or any of these toys we've been talking about that you'd like to go over? I just want to, you know, see more at this point. It's not going to happen, but uh, it was great to be able to play in a different area for a little bit to expand the future. And uh, as marketing synergies go, it's cynical to say that they really did develop the greatest toy commercial for a couple of years, but they did. It worked well. We were all really excited to buy all this stuff. Uh, it wasn't for everybody, but a lot of people were done with the prequels anyway, so it's not like it matters at that point. It was just uh, <laughs> not all Star Wars is for all people exactly exactly and it doesn't need to be uh you know there's things that can appeal to some people and not others there's toys that can um you know be intended for a certain group of of a collector a certain type of collector but not necessarily everybody and i think it's all good i mean that's it's totally cool that they have things that appeal to different subsets of uh, people yeah and uh if there's ever any opportunities for more clone war stuff uh, i am sure there are people still very excited to buy it 100 percent um, so, Adam, where can our listeners go to find you online on social media? Well, you can find me uh, on most platforms at Adam16Bit. I have a Twitter. I have an Instagram. It's just photos taken with the Game Boy camera. Uh, and you can also find me on uh, Entertainment Earth, where I do the Entertainment Earth podcast every Friday. Very cool. So I will throw some links in the show notes. Uh, you guys, go ahead and check Adam out online. I'm sure you have already. But just in case, uh, you know, go ahead and hit up those show notes and uh, subscribe and uh, follow on uh, all of those platforms. Uh, Adam, thanks again. As always, it's been a pleasure having you on Cantina Chatter. Thanks for having me. Can't wait to come back next time. Once again, a tremendous thanks to Adam Paulus for coming onto the show to talk about the Clone Wars micro series and its corresponding toy line. Such a cool little toy line. Uh, check it out on the Rebel Scum Photo Archives. I will throw a link in the description and be sure to stay tuned for our next episode of Cantina Chatter Podcast in which we will be talking about all things San Diego Comic Con, especially the toy lines that we love to collect. If you aren't already, subscribe to The Place It All Started, the Victoria's Cantina YouTube channel where I review new toys and showcase retro toys from the past. You can also follow us for news and updates on Facebook by looking up Victoria's Cantina, toy photography on Instagram at Victoria's Cantina, and a constant drip of toy-related and other random and nonsensical tweets on Twitter at Vix Cantina. If you're so inclined, we are on Patreon. Gain greater access to Victoria's Cantina by becoming a Patreon Cantina patron. For as little as a dollar a month, you'll help to keep the show going and also get exclusive content such as access to a private Twitter feed, early access to toy reviews, and behind the scenes featurettes. And if you can't, but you still want to help us out, one of the easiest and most helpful things you can do is leave us a review over on Apple Podcasts. It only takes a minute, so hit that 5-star rating and leave a note stating why you enjoy the show. It'll make us more visible on iTunes and help others to find our show. As always, I'm Victoria, and no matter where you're listening out in the galaxy, I'd like to thank you for tuning in to the Cantina Chatter Podcast. Podcast.